had a very different feel than the other little charming towns we've stopped in. The, the most noticeable thing was no talking. They looked like extras in A Night of the Living Dead. I always appreciate older buildings. They have a story. I didn't dream what this story would be. <laughs> Souls walk around and they don't know where they're going. It's not a good thing. <laughs> we walked up together. I got right to the door. I saw this mass of air. And I felt pulled outside. It would not be the norm for me to go out to the pool, especially with my son. When I heard his voice, he's laughing. Oh, God. I'm not a suspicious kind of, you know, supernatural kind of guy. I, I kind of have a clean record of, hey, the world is real and everything goes according to plan and logic. And then there's this big blemish that actually happened to me. And so it wasn't theory and there was no logic to it. When I hear other people's stories now, I give it a lot more credibility because I got a weird one of my own. This is when I first got married. I got married in 1980. So, yeah, my wife and I, we went to England for our honeymoon. And we went to London. And then part of the, the second half of the trip was to rent a car and drive through the countryside of England. So we spent a couple days doing that. We had this little thing. We were puttering around, a bottle of scotch in the back and some chocolate kept us going. And uh, we saw mostly churches. That seemed to be what England was about. So this one leg of the trip was going to a part of England called the Moors. I'd heard about the Moors from Sherlock Holmes movies. That's, the, that's why I wanted to go there, because it was always this place of mystery. So I guess my wife had set up a bed and breakfast that we were heading towards in a little town called Tavistock, England. As we're driving across the moors, and like, God, this really is beautiful little fog, you know, and it's gorgeous. So she's got the map, and it's like, hey, looks like there's a little church uh, up ahead. Why don't we take that? So keep going, and then I'll tell you when We're in the middle of the moors, and there's a town, an exit or something, for this town called Whittacombe to see the Whittacombe Church. And so we had a little bit of extra time, and so my wife and I, we said, let's pull into Whittacombe. It seemed somewhat isolated. Once you leave it, there's nothing else for another 10 miles, and there wasn't probably something 10 miles before it. So we pulled into this town, beautiful, like, town square and uh, a little pub, it looked like and this big church was the center piece of the, of the town square. So we parked in this spot. I mean, when we got out of the car, we were nothing but optimistic, wide open for another charming experience. We're walking, thinking, well, should we get something at that little pub or whatever? And we're like, oh, God, charming. This is so charming. Except, like, this town had a very different feel than the other little charming towns we'd, we'd uh, stopped in. Because as we're walking through the town, it was like a really icky and kind of cold feeling. Like, is this strange to you? Is this strange to you?
There was about, yeah, 30 or 40 people milling about. They're all walking at a particular pace. The, the most noticeable thing was no talking. That was uh, strange. And their lack of eye contact. They looked like extras in a movie uh, of, of uh, Night of the Living Dead. And then as we started to like become a little bit more aware of our surroundings, we saw that everybody was dressed in black. There was absolutely no color on the street of, of anybody walking around. Again, no talking. The town was silent. We could see their faces, but everybody was sort of staring straight ahead, blank expression, kind of a weird vibe to the whole block. And at this point, my wife and I decided to get out of there. How do we get to Tavistock? How do we get back on that road to Tavistock? So we're in front of the Whittacombe Church. We approached a woman who was standing by herself, and so figured maybe we wouldn't be interrupting her. She's all in black from behind with a kind of a veil thing over her head. And we say, uh, do you know the way to Tavistock? And then it was like a movie moment. The eyes are the creepiest, scariest part. There's no color. She's lost the color of her eyes. And it's just a milky wash. And that's the moment when she started speaking in tongues. I've heard of speaking in tongues. And I think that that's what this woman started doing. She obviously looked possessed and sounded possessed and felt that way to us. But we nearly lost it at that point. Uh, we were polite enough to let her finish whatever she was saying and then uh, made a beeline for the car. All right, that, that, that was creepy. Was that the creepiest thing you've ever seen? Yes, we're like, oh my God, what just happened to us? And I'm saying, let's just get out of the moors to Tavistock and get there. And we hit the road. And I'm driving out of the town. And I'm like, my, I'm gripped on the wheel like this. And she's saying, oh my God. I'm about a mile out of town, maybe a half a mile, mile out of town. And all of a sudden, kaboom! And the, it, one of our tires had exploded. Oh my god, what happened? Got a flat tire. We've got to go back. It really took a turn when the tire exploded. That just didn't, I couldn't figure that one out. I mean, the, the logical choice, we weren't that far. We were right at the town. We should go back and get the tire fixed. No, no, we're not stopping. We're not stopping, not until we get to that bed and breakfast. I'm looking back at the town of Whittacombe and the church looming in the very near distance. Are we going to go back? Kaboom, our tires exploded. I'm looking back at the town of Whittacombe and the church looming in the very near distance. And are we going to go back to get our tire? How? I mean, now we're stuck in the middle of the moors with this uh, ghost town behind us. Have a stock 10 miles down the road. Okay. All right. I just drove on the tire. And my wife said, we're not stopping. We're not stopping. We're never getting out of this car until we get to that bed and breakfast. I drove 10 miles. I drove on the rim.
we got to the bed and breakfast and uh, you know, we're like, yeah, we're, I mean, literally shaking. And, you know, blabbing our story as soon as we're checking in of why we were late. We stopped on the way here at this town of Whitacombe. And they're saying, oh yeah, Whitacombe. Yeah, you shouldn't have gone to Whitacombe. That's a haunted town. A haunted town. The people at the hotel were like, yeah, don't go there. Nobody goes there. This Whitacombe church and Whitacombe, the town itself, that's a ghost town. I don't believe in that. But they said, don't go there. There's a lot of dead people walking around. It took place in the 1600s. I mean, they talk about this incredible lightning, incredible thunder. This was a Sunday. The church was filled with people. And they, the, the, the steeple from the church fell down into the church. The building came down. Yeah, the, the, it, was, it was a massive destruction. Evidently, it was, I mean, it was a huge thing that happened to this town. That's a big wound for a town to absorb. And maybe they just haven't fully absorbed it yet. Those people walking around were the spirits of, the, of those dead people. These people are in their own purgatory where they're, they can't go and they can't stay and they, they, they have to relive this tragedy. Again, it was more the feeling of just get out of here get out, stop looking. When you think of the tragedy that this town had, that was the feeling like, get out. Just get out of here. We did, we got the message. That's 30 years ago, and it's still very, very real to my wife and I. I've been told because the East Coast has been there and been civilized and populated for so much longer than the West Coast, they, they supposedly have more ghosts. And I would say that's, that's true. Well, I did a film, and I was really having a really good time in Wilmington because it's a fascinating place. I love history, and it's full of history. It was established in 1720, and there were a lot of historic markers around the town, and actually most of those historic markers were from the Civil War. We were shooting in a building that dated back to the Civil War and maybe even a little before. And uh, it was a brick building. And it was uh, with, you know, wooden, old wooden stairs and that creaked. <laughs> so we had to be careful when uh, we were rolling sound. It was a courthouse and it still functioned as a courthouse. I always appreciate older buildings like that um, because they, there's just, they, they have an elegance and they have, a, they have a story. I didn't dream what this story would be. There was something very strange going on in this building. We were to shoot there three days. We're in the building and all the lights are adjusted and you know, we always have a gazillion amount of lights around. And we're just about ready to roll camera. 112, big two. And... and action! The lights all go out. And, okay, everybody's seen that happen, no big deal. Oh, what now, people? Come on! 
You know, there are a lot of macho guys on sets, you know? They don't worry about why something happened. They just fix it. There are always problems when you're shooting a movie, like the rest of life. And then they try to plug in something else. This seems to be the problem. The power goes out altogether. We had no lights. We had no electricity. It's going to be fine, Sheldon. It's going to be fine. And it was strange. And that's just on the first day. And everybody's kind of, what's going on? I must say, I don't remember that ever happening before on a set. Next time we go back for the second day. And we have problems on that day, too. I've never heard of the sound guy not being able to roll his sound. I don't feel good about that. That's a very strange thing. And I've made a lot of movies and done a lot of television. And I'm here to tell you, I have never had that many problems in one location, in one set. So there was a group of us walking back to where we stayed. And some of the group were extras that were local, that lived in Wilmington. And I said to one of them, what is the deal with that building? I've never experienced so many problems in one location in my life. And he said, oh, you know, that was a prison during the Civil War. And I guess a lot of the soldiers died in fire. It's, it's haunted. And everybody just kept walking. Nobody said anything, including me. I didn't know what to say. I'd never heard anyone very casually say, it's haunted. When he said that, I, I was just stunned. And like I said, nobody said anything. Well, you know, I mean, anybody, anybody that dies in a prison um, during a war, um, and, and is in the prison on the wrong side, um, I'm, I'm sure they would not be happy souls. On the third day, I, I, w I was really exasperated because it had slowed down our shooting. There's all this kind of creepy stuff, and I felt like I was the only one that was noticing it. We're shooting in the basement, and I did kind of snoop around a little bit, I, you know, I don't, I usually don't have a lot of time to do that sort of thing, but yeah, I did go down and look at the basement. The basement area, the lowest part of the building, was dark and dank. <gasps> we were to shoot there, and that's the area that was the prison. Oh. and where the soldiers died. I look over, and there was a little bit of a rustling noise. Supposedly, souls walk around, and they're, many of them don't even know that they've passed away. They, they don't know where they're going. They, they don't have a real life. So it's not a good thing. I look over, and there was a little bit of a rustling noise. Supposedly, souls walk around, and they're, many of them don't even know that they've passed away. They, they don't know where they're going. They, they don't have a real life. So it's not a good thing. Fast, fast, fast. I said move. Don't you eyeball me. You hear me? Don't you eyeball me. 
You know what I'm saying, boy? I ended up saying a little prayer for the soldiers that died. <clears throat> I know that you, you may not know this, but you're, you're, you're dead. dead. <clears throat> and you need to go, go back, back into, into the, the light. light. And you'll be joined by many of your loved ones. I had to keep repeating that. It is time for you to move on. Every time there was a movement that didn't seem normal. It's time for you to move on. It's time for you to move on. And then all of a sudden, the light exploded. All of a sudden, it was there were a lot of flames. And it was on fire. There, there definitely was an energy to that, to that fire. It, it felt like a very menacing present, presence. And that was creepy. We asked somebody that was trying to clean it up or put the fire out or whatever, you know, what happened? I don't know what happened, you know? Yeah, there was no explanation for it. Um, fortunately, nothing else like that happened. But that boy, that one time was really bad. Very uncomfortable. I was scared to death. Because I, as I said, I, I, I hadn't allowed myself to consciously think that that would be possible. <laughs> I did not grow up in a house where people spoke of ghosts or paranormal activity. My father, I would say, would probably be a non-believer in just about any of that. You didn't talk about this kind of thing. We were a very tight-knit family. It was just my brother, Michael, and my mom and dad, and we were very close. My brother was bossy. My brother had to always give the rules, so we grew up very competitive, but loving and close. And my brother took care of all of us. You know, he'd go to one house and fix the electricity, he'd go to the other house and fix the plumbing, and then he'd go home, so, and take care of his family there. So he was a person that a lot of people leaned on, and my brother was the closest person on the planet to me. Six years ago, I was pregnant with my son, and two weeks before my son was born, my brother passed away suddenly. It was shocking and devastating to the family because my brother was very healthy and young. And I always thought that my brother and I, as we got older, would raise our kids and our you know, children would grow up together. So after my brother passed away, I named my son Michael. I had woken up very early and I took my son outside by the swimming pool. I don't know why I went out to the pool, because at that time of the morning, it would not be the norm for me to go out to the pool, especially with my son, and I just, if I felt a prompting, I felt pulled outside. It just seemed like the place to sit down at that time. I was sitting with my son and thinking about what was coming that day, and it was very quiet out there, and just kind of that little morning chill in June. And um, I heard my brother's voice behind me. When I heard his voice, first of all, I thought that somebody had come into the backyard, that a stranger had come into the backyard, but it was Mike's voice, and I thought, And when I turned around, 
my brother was standing by the side of the pool. There was a lightness to him. I don't want to say not solid because he was real, but the outline of Mike was not um, precise. But I knew it was him. When I heard his voice, it wasn't a hello. It wasn't a greeting of any kind. It was just in typical Mike form, launching into, here's how it is. Here's how it goes. Here's what we're going to do. My brother had a deck of cards in his hand, and he was giving instructions about how to play this particular card game. And he started taking the cards one by one and kind of tossing them into the pool. And as they were kind of floating on top of the pool, some of them were sinking down, and he was giving directions about that you had to dive in and get as many cards as you could. But if you could get the nines, and the tens. The nines or the tens, those would be the best. That's the one that you want, especially the ten of spades. But if you could get the ten of spades, that would mean that you won, that everything would be OK. You have nothing to worry about. Life was good. Got it? As I want to talk to him, or I want to say something to him, or I want him to continue. There's a knock at the door. I have this huge door knocker and just echoed through the house. And I was so jarred as I whipped my head around to the door to see what the noise was. And when I turned back, my brother was gone. But there was still that rippling in the pool like there had been activity. My sister-in-law, Angelica, my brother's wife, knocked on the door, and she was coming over to help me with my son. And I was torn if I should tell my sister-in-law about it, because everybody was so emotional about the death of my brother. And I made a decision not to tell my sister-in-law to lose somebody suddenly who's healthy and vibrant and having fun in life. You're always looking for something to make sense. I think that's why I chose to go to a medium, just to look for some kind of an answer. I didn't know what to expect. I thought it sounded crazy. But at the time, you'll do anything if there's a remote possibility of maybe feeling better or having a connection or an answer. I told her my name. And she started describing people that were showing up. Few people are coming through. She said to me, Michael, it's coming that my brother was there. The medium brought my brother up right off the bat. And I thought, yeah, right. That's pretty nice. But when she started talking about Mike Long hair. and what he looked like and how he was dressed, I knew it was him. She said, he's not saying anything. He's laughing. He's laughing. And I said, I have no idea what that means. And she said, he says you do. And I said, I have no idea what that means. She said, he's cracking up. And he said, you'll figure it out. You will figure it out. He's laughing. He's laughing. <laughs> And I said, I have no idea what that means. And she said, he says you do. And I said, I have no idea what that means. She said, he's cracking up. And he said, you'll figure it out. You will figure it out. And that was basically the whole experience with the medium. I didn't feel a closure. I didn't feel um, like I had the answers, because none of it makes sense. So one morning, I got ready for work and headed to the studio. It was very early. Nobody was even there yet. And I went into my dressing room, 
I wasn't feeling strong. Going back to work after losing my brother and the birth of my son, um, my state of mind was fragile to say the least. I felt sad. There was a part of me that didn't feel like I could get through the day or that it wasn't time to go back to work. I started walking towards the stage and um, I don't know if I wanted to walk in to you know, be by myself for a moment on the stage, but I felt drawn to the stage door. When I reached for the door handle, there sat the ten of spades. And I, I stood there for a moment because obviously it was the tennis page, which was the best card you could get. Put it to the highest card. That's the one that you want, especially the tennis page. That means everything's gonna be okay. And because I had just seen my brother and I hadn't told anybody about this, I didn't know what to feel, but I, I started laughing because that would be so Mike to do something like that. I just <laughs> said, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> because the medium kept saying, he's cracking up, and then finally he just went, ugh, she'll get it. She'll figure it out. I think that my brother came to me when he did because I needed to know that everything was going to be OK, that I had it in spades, that, um, that he was OK and that he was there still. <laughs> when I finally did tell people about the story in my family, everybody had something similar that Mike had done, you know, left for them or come to, you know, come to them in his usual bossy way, but letting my family know that everything was good and that we would be okay. I still have the ten of spades. I've had more than one experience, but I'm gonna tell you about this particular one today. It was scary, yet really made me a believer. My band, Guns N' Roses, was pretty legendary for partying. But at this time, I was completely sober, hadn't had a drink, and was being very professional. After being on the road, I decided to get into producing. Uh, when I came off tour, Jim Mitchell, who worked with me with Guns N' Roses, was my recording engineer. Jim was the guy that worked all the technical stuff, the board, the microphones, setting them all up and getting everything sounding great. So he was my main man, my, my right-hand man. And I found a young band that I really liked, really liked their sound. So I booked a recording studio called Studio 56 on Santa Monica Boulevard. And I took the band in there. recorded all the instruments and the vocals and guitars and whatnot. Yeah. At this point of the evening, it was pretty late, like I said, one, two o'clock in the morning. A love I can't deny. We started recording more lead vocals with the singer of the group. Don't try to want the and as we were recording the vocals, everything sounded fine. She was singing. Everything was perfectly normal. Oh, 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 oh. And then every time we play back the tape, this is a little strange. Sorry, guys. There was this low, kind of a voice rumbling sound on the vocal track. 
low, ooh, type voice. It's almost like a Gregorian kind of chant sound. We were like, what is that? You know, Jim Mitchell was one of the best engineers and still is. You know, he's won awards, he's got Grammys. Okay. Here's a guy that's been working on records his whole life, saying this had never happened to him before ever. So we'd go back and record the vocal again. And we, we continue to do this about four or five times. Clouding up her mind, or is it that? And at that point, we just gave up, and the band all left. The band took off. And at that point, we moved on to another instrument and uh, came back later and did the vocal again, and everything was fine, but it was very strange. Jim and myself were there late into the night. At this point, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. We were laying back and listening back, leaning in, in our chairs, checking out all the music that we recorded, and just with our eyes closed. We were laying back and listening back, leaning in, in our chairs, checking out all the music that we recorded, and just with our eyes closed. Jim kind of jumps out of his chair, looks over at me, and he's crying. I said, Jim, what's up? He says, did you push my chair? And I was just like, ah, uh, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I'm way over here, man. I didn't do anything. And he's like, man, this is crazy. So Jim decided to get up and go to the bathroom and came back to the recording studio, went into the control room and had this white, you know, state of shock look on his face. And said, I just, I just saw a ghost. And I said, really, how do you know? He says, well, this guy walked by me in the bathroom. And then he disappeared in the stall. And there was nobody there in the stall, or it was no voice, vanished. He was starting to get pretty freaked out. And at that point, I said, well, let me see if anybody else is here in the studio. He says, nah, this it's empty. I, I know it's empty. Everyone's gone. All around us, the you know, the other studios in the area were were empty. Everyone had gone home. The only person that was still there was the receptionist. Walked down the hallway to the lounge. We walked up together. I got right to the door uh, casing. A voice said, don't come in here, you're not invited. And there's like a wall there, there's a presence there. Out of my left corner of my eye, I saw this mass of air that looked like a small cloud floating across the room. <laughs> and directly in front of me, about here, I put my hand out. When I touched it, I backed off like this. It ran up my arm and down body. And chill feeling just came to me like ice. That shocked me. It was a sensation that took over my body for that, that split second and then was gone again. At that point, what just happened? State of shock. We were pretty freaked out, so made a quick 
descent down the staircase back to the control room. We packed up and thought, I don't think we'll be coming back here because the studio was definitely haunted. So I went up to talk to the receptionist. I said to him, there seems to be some strange ghost-like energy in this building. And he said, oh yeah, we've heard that before years earlier. In about 1991, they discovered a head and an arm in a garbage can. The garbage can where they found the head and the arm was directly behind Studio 56. Somebody that was murdered and uh, there's a lot of anger there. I was in a state of shock, but then it, it came clear that what I was seeing were definitely ghosts. This person that was in the lounge, or the person on the tape, or the person that pushed Jim, was somebody that found a place to hide out or hadn't crossed over and just wanted quiet and wanted us out of there. Didn't want our music or our presence or whatever. And that had happened quite a few times. And they had had clients leave the, leave the premises because of strange events, you know. And all the employees quit and moved to a different studio. Studio 56 finally went out of business. And um, in retrospect, it was an experience that I'll never forget. It really made me know that there are ghost-like uh, elements in the, in the world that, that do exist.